Habakkuk, chapter 1, verse 5. And it is not as clear in the King James as it is in the New International Version. So we're going to listen to someone who can find this verse. There's still a little echo in the sound system. Please remove it completely. I don't want any echo in the sound system. So one, two, three. Let's just take the time to get this thing out of the sound system. One, two, three. Tell me when the echo leaves. One, two, three, four. Is it still there? I'm sorry? It's just the way the room is. Okay. We will excuse the room. Everybody say you are excused. <laughs> Acts chapter, or excuse me, Habakkuk chapter 1, verse 5. My wife has it in the NIV. I'm going to ask her to rise and read it to you. And I want you to get excited about the message tonight that Jesus is coming. God is doing something in our days that we can't believe even though we are told. And that thing that is happening is that the Jewish people, led by the Orthodox community, not the secular Jews, the religious group, are very, very excited about the coming of Messiah. They are saying and doing things that they have not done since 70 AD. If you know your history, Christianity is actually older by a few years than today's rabbinic Judaism. If you have a synagogue in your city, it is not biblical Judaism. It is rabbinic Judaism. And the difference is this, when their temple was destroyed in 70 AD, the rabbis took control of Judaism and they began to pass requirements and laws that had to do with obeying God even though they did not own the temple mound. Of the 613 commandments that the Jews have identified for us, clearly most of them cannot be carried out because they're not in control of the Temple Mount. So we read in Deuteronomy chapter 17, verses 8 through 10, what they have done about it. What do we do if the Torah commands us to sacrifice a sheep on the Mount, Mount Zion? And we don't have control of Mount Zion. So it says in Deuteronomy 17, 8 through 10, that when you have a difficult situation that you cannot answer, you go to those who are in charge at the time. And those who are in charge now and have been since 70 A.D. are the rabbis. And you ask them the hard question. Then it says in this passage, do what they tell you. In fact, it even warns you that there is a penalty if you don't do as the rabbis say. It is most shocking to people that what we call the church did not start in Acts chapter 2, verse 4. It's a shock to people to find out that in Acts chapter 7, verse number 38, 
that the church actually began at Mount Sinai in the wilderness in Exodus 19 and 20. Remember this morning we read to the Jew first. So Luke tells us in Acts 7.38 that the church was the church where Christ was present in the church in the wilderness. So the church is both Jewish and Gentile. It has been, is now, and will always be. When the Israelis left Egypt, it just wasn't Jewish people who left. If you read the scriptures carefully, you will find that Gentiles who believed in God and the Messiah left with them. If you read Hosea chapter 2, you will find out that God is alluring the Jews back to Israel, and you are watching that right now. And it says, not only them, but in verse 21 of Hosea chapter 2, the church will also be comprised of Gentiles, people who are not a people. And for that reason, I pause to allow you to cheer that the church doesn't just mean Jews. It includes a few New Yorkers. Some from New Jersey. Some from Passai City. Excuse me for those that don't know that. Manila. How many have heard the word Manila? Those who are from Germany. Anybody? Am I the only German here tonight? I'm it. Boy, am I, am I a small group. And it even includes those who sprakens the Spanish. Now let's hoot and holler and praise God that the church is inclusive. So God's going to do a new thing in our time, and you're not even going to believe it when you hear it. So, let's begin by studying together Malachi chapter 4, the last verse of the Old Testament. It's just before that book joined in marriage. Malachi 4, 6. What has been going on? That's a new thing that you wouldn't even believe it if you hear it. What's God doing? If Jesus is coming, how many would like to see that doctrine through God's eyes? He's the one that sets the stage, and it was beautifully portrayed by both dances tonight and the praise and worship. What the Lord is going to do is... Turn the heart of the fathers to the children. And he's going to turn the heart of the children to the fathers. That's the new thing that's going on. The hearts of the father are turning to the children, and the hearts of the children are turning to the father. It's slow particularly in America, for the Christian church to absorb what God is doing, but God doesn't need the American church to carry out his will. The American church is always behind the world when it comes to the new things of God. We are very staid, and we're very comfortable where we are, and we don't like to things to change. But we read in the Holy Scriptures, one of the new things that God is going to do, it is found in Zechariah, the prophet Zechariah, chapter 8. Zechariah, chapter 8. We are in these exact days. Zechariah 8, verse 23. And when you read, when you read in those days, when you
you read that phrase, it is speaking of these days, in those days, the days of Messiah, the days of his return. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, in those days it shall come to pass that ten men shall take hold out of all languages of the nations, even shall take hold of the skirt, and that should be the prayer shawl for those that want to have the full understanding, the prayer shawl of him that is a Jew. And they will come to Jerusalem and they will say what? We will go with you, and this is hard for Christians, because the next sentence says, for we have heard that God is with you. How can that be? They rejected Jesus, didn't they? Folks, please relax. When Jesus was speaking to a Jew in the gospel and to a group of his disciples, decidedly Jewish, he said to them, who were his sheep, Other sheep have I that are not of this fold. And he was referring to you. It was a Jew who said, in our defense, Leave those Gentiles alone. They are getting saved by grace just like we got saved. Part of God's family is part of the Jewish community. And it says in Zechariah 8.23 that people like me from all of the nations of the world who speak different languages shall come to Jerusalem and say, we notice, we notice something. We want to hang out with you because we notice God is with you. There is no other explanation to the founding of the Jewish nation on May 14, 1948, except God was with them. To form a nation you have to do three things prior to declaring your independence. Number one, you have to form a military organization. The Jewish people began in the late 1800s with an organization called the Haganah. They're now called the IDF. They began to build their army before 1900. Second thing you need if you're a nation, you have to have a national bank. And so they formed the Palestinian Bank Limited, which is today called Bank Lumi. It is the national bank of the state of Israel. And the third thing you have to do is form an educational system because a nation that succeeds is an educated nation. You look at all of the nations at the world that clearly struggle, and you look to their educational system, you will find it either non-existent or very weak. Wherever there is a strong nation, there is a strong educational backbone. So they formed the university we know as the Hebrew University, and they even invited my professor's professor to be the first president of the Hebrew University, and he declined. He said, I'm not good with people. And his name is Albert Einstein. And he turned down the position of the first president of the Hebrew University. Not a bad person to ask to do some things for you. So folks, this nation didn't just erupt on May 14, 1948. There's been a move of God in the background while we've been watching, and the Jews are being evacuated from all of the nations where the Lord has scattered them. 
And some would like to get on the Christian hobby horse and say, since you rejected Jesus, you Jews, God is punishing you by putting you in all of the nations of the world. Now, I want you to think more soberly than that. If you wanted to protect a nation, the best thing you could possibly do is hide them in every other nation. If you put them together in one place at one time, as they are now, they become very vulnerable to atomic bombs. Ask the Ayatollah Khomeini. The best thing for the enemy was to get them to move to Israel because now three atomic bombs could wipe out the entire country. It is so small, you cannot defend it. But the Lord's bringing them home. He's putting in their hearts the sound of a trumpet, and they are coming back to live in this land. And I'm telling you our sermon tonight on Shemitah, to release. God is releasing all of the Jews from Europe, from Central and South America, from Africa, from Europe, from Russia, and believe it or not, they're even showing up from China. That's how far they've been dispersed. So when the Lord says, in these days, these days we live in, the Jews are going to have another situation that they have to deal with it, and that's a bunch of Gentiles coming and saying, we want very much to hang out with you because we notice God is with you. I want you to say, in the face of Adolf Hitler, Joseph Stalin, and in the name of Isabella and Ferdinand, I want you to give God a praise offering because no matter what the enemy tried to do in history, there is a nation reformed today that was there when God scattered them. And he said, I would bring you back in Ezekiel chapter 37. Give God a praise offering. Now, if you turn in your Bibles to Isaiah chapter 2, we find the reason why people like myself and others are going and befriending rabbis. In Isaiah chapter 2, the word that Isaiah the son of Amos saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. And it shall come to pass in the last days. What days? These days that the mountains of the Lord's house shall be established in the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills and all the nations shall flow to it. When you read that verse and you're a guide in Israel or you've been on tour with me or anyone else and you walk the streets of Jerusalem, you're likely to hear every language in the earth. Nations are flowing there. And because Americans watch CNN, they don't go to Israel anymore. So that opened the door for Europe and China and, and India and Japan. And so Israel's tourism goes right along. We're just not there because we watch stupid news programs that are very anti-Semitic. I want to tell you, the safest place on earth is not Detroit, New York, Baltimore, Charlotte. The safest place in the world is where God dwells and the, t the land of peace. I never hesitate. I always have people cancel on their tours because of some report of a knifing or of a shooting or of a whatever. Folks, we had a delight this week. Uh, I came into the dining hall the first day I was here, and I was introduced by Mark to the uh, priest of the Coptic Church. He had some uh, 30 or 40, I don't, how many Ted were there? About 30 Coptic young men. Coptic is simply the way they say the Egyptian Christian Church, Coptic, Egyptas, Egypt we say. So the church is Coptic, and there was a bunch of people 
And so this big, wide-bodied, white-haired old man walked up and said, Gif halik, habibi. Ahlam asalan. Gif inti. Somebody probably wanted to shoot me because I was speaking Arabic, you know. But our understanding is so cloistered and so parochial, so that we think anybody that speaks Arabic has to be a terrorist. Well, I'm the poster boy. So I want you to know very clearly that the nations are flowing to Israel to grab hold of the prayer shawl of a Jew and say, I'd like to study the Torah with you because I notice God is with you and I notice that you have some understanding that I lack. So, Dr. Carl in 2012 wrote a letter to Rabbi Israel Matlau, the chief rabbi of the state of Israel, and I asked permission to meet with him. And unfortunately, he was out of the country during my visit, so he introduced me to Rabbi Melchior, he introduced me to Rabbi Riskin, and to Rabbi Rosen with whom now I have developed a relationship based on the scriptures that I have read to you. What is my job? Turn to Isaiah chapter 40 and you will see what my job is. When I heard this being sung tonight and danced, and I saw the virgins with their olive oil prepared to meet the Messiah, and the word of the Lord in the shape of a spear. Did I get it all, Bonnie? What did I miss? The, I didn't know the symbolism of the flags. You just kind of whipped them around and said, come. Faithful and true. Thank you. That is the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. He is the faithful and true one. Isaiah 40. What's my job? Comfort ye, comfort ye my people. What's my job? To comfort Jewish people. With what words? What are the words I'm supposed to speak comfortably to her? That her warfare is accomplished. You need to, you need to know that the Hebrew word to inherit, we always hear that the Jews should inherit the promised land, is not a passive word that you wait till someone dies and then it inures to your benefit. To inherit means take it by force. Not only to take it by force, but be strong enough to keep it when they come and try to take it back from you. That's the word inherit. Imagine what they're up against. We want the land handed to us. No, you have to what? Fight for it and fight to keep it. How many have had a little vision change? Your warfare is accomplished. You have the land. When Benjamin Netanyahu stood several, it's been more than a year ago, before the United Nations and quoted the prophet and said, we are not leaving. How many like someone who speaks crisp, clear sentences? And he quoted the prophet that we're here forever. We're not leaving. His kind words after Orlando made me want him to run for our presidency. He was sensitive enough to, to handle the gay issue and the black and the white issue, and he spoke even-handedly because he spoke on behalf of God. Oh, folks, we need some people to come and speak comfortably to Israel that her wars are over. It's in your hands. And implication here is, we're with you. Hang on to that thought. Then it says, your iniquity is pardoned, for you have received of the Lord's hand double for all her sins. You see, when they did reject Messiah and they were scattered, the Lord punished them, and now that punishment has been fulfilled 
and now something is reawakening in God's people, and we Gentiles are the ones that are stimulating this. Why? Look what this verse was that they sang and danced tonight. The voice of him that crieth in the wilderness, say it with me, prepare ye the way of the Lord. How many believe he's coming? Look at verse 5. The glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together. Why? Because the mouth of the Lord has spoken. Prepare ye the way of the Lord. Why? He's coming. So the title tonight is the word Shemitah. It's a big word that simply means to release. Anyone who's been held in prison and has been set free, they know the word Shemitah. They are released. The, dar, the, bar, uh, the bar doors open and they walk out. And uh, you have that fe feeling, <laughs> I'm sure you've all seen, with that great actor, the black actor who is in Shawshank, Morgan Freeman, probably one of the best actors in our time. Anyway, remember when he walked out? <laughs> he didn't know whether he wanted to be out or not. But you're released. And so Israel has an entire chapter, Leviticus 25, dedicated to the concept of release. And God has in this chapter that your land that you plant every year should be released every seventh year Lay fallow, you can eat anything that comes up by itself without you working it from last year's planting, but you should release the land every seven years. You should release indentured servants, those who come to work for you because you paid off their debts. You should release them from the debts. So the laws concerning Shemitah are so profound. But I want you to see Leviticus 25, verse 23. I will be preaching on this Saturday night. The laws of Shemitah, the laws of release, tucked in this chapter is a very clear verse that was brought to my attention by Rabbi Melchior after we had become friends. He is a member and has been a member of the Knesset, and he does work for them so that they can understand how and why to pass certain laws. When Rabbi Melchior came to verse number 23, he said to me, Carl, this is what I'm trying to get the Knesset in Israel to adopt as law. Remember what we started with? God said, I'm going to do things in front of your eyes that you're not even going to believe, even if you're told them. Well, here is Rabbi Melchior saying to the Knesset, the land is not Israeli. The land is not Arabic. The Jews and the Muslims don't own the land. The land belongs to God. The land is mine, saith the Lord. And I said to him, Rabbi, what, what are you trying to tell the Knesset? He said, if they'll pass the law of Leviticus 25, 23, I can go to the Muslims and say, we've been wrong. The land is not ours. They've been fighting over it since May 14, 1948. Every day. Someone is killed every day somewhere in the world because of who owns that land. And here is an Orthodox rabbi saying, I want the Knesset to pass a law that declares that the land and the whole world would hear it 
the day they pass the law, that the land does not belong to Israel, the land does not belong to the Arabs, it belongs to Jehovah. Now that we've settled that, how are we going to live here together? Let's work this out. And one of the things that would be a benefit from this chapter 25 is the Jews can't plant on the seventh year, but the Arabs can. And there's a provision in Leviticus 25 that the Jew can purchase food grown by Gentiles by the barter system of selling them or changing food for clay jars or plates or knives and forks or bags or whatever is being bartered, and so they could live together in a beautiful relationship, both benefiting from the land. How many recognize this is the condition under which we all will live when the Messiah is in residence, and it is his land, there'll be no more conflict over it. Anybody ever get excited? You're going to hear things tonight you cannot believe, but you have a brother, an Orthodox Jewish rabbi, trying to bring the laws of the land of Israel into conformity to the Word of God. How many would like to see that in the U.S. Congress and the United States Senate and the United States Supreme Court? Let's bring our laws into conformity to the Word of God. Nobody gets excited, so I'll move along. Now, what are the aims of the law? The primary aim of the Levitical Shemitah laws was to reunite, reunite owners to their land. The Jews do not obey anything in Leviticus chapter 25 to this day because it's predicated on verse 10 and 9 that says that the land belongs to the owners. You have the tribe of Judah. You have the tribe of Zebulun. You have the tribe of Dan. And they all lived within a geographical border. And until that condition is met, that the Jews go back and find out their family and their tribe and live in their family's land, they can't reinstitute these laws. That's their excuse. How many know somebody that can bypass that? I hate to tell Christians this because they never believe me, but you Christians obey over 260 of the commandments. And yet you walk around saying, I'm not under the law. What a foolish statement we make. How many believe that God exists? That's law number one. How many believe you ought to love him? That's number two. How many believe in his Godhead, Father, Son, and Spirit? That's number three. How many like to confess your sins to get him to forgive and cleanse you? That's not 1 John 1, 9. That's commandment number 73. Let's all say it. Oy vey. You're Jewish. Because you've been circumcised. You obey more of the commands as a Christian than today's modern-day Orthodox Jews. Hello? It's quiet in here. Now, I keep banging on their doors. Who's Rabbi Malchior, the one that's trying to pass the Shemitah law in the year 2000? He's the one that invited and succeeded to get to come to Israel, Pope John. Pope left the Vatican, went to Jerusalem, and appeared on television for over a week. All of Israel shut, uh, shut their businesses down, and they all watched the Pope for a whole week. And he apologized day after day for 2,000 years of anti-Semitism. It so caught the Jews off guard, they were stunned that the Christians who had put them into ovens at Dachau and Auschwitz were now saying, we're sorry, we were wrong. Who is this guy? He's the one in the Knesset trying to pass the Shemitah laws. 
So past December, I was minding my own business. Somebody made me aware of a document that was published by these rabbis. Those three included, who I have named by name, 65 rabbis made the following declaration. December 3, 2015, the Orthodox Rabbinic Statement on Christianity. After nearly 2,000 years of mutual hostility and alienation, we Orthodox rabbis who lead communities, institutions, and seminaries in Israel, the United States, and Europe, recognize the historic opportunity now before us. We seek to do the will of our Father in heaven by accepting the hand offered to us by our Christian brothers and sisters. This is unprecedented. They wouldn't talk to us. We're older than they are. Christianity was formed in 33 AD. Rabbinic Judaism was formed in 70 AD. Who is the father and the child whose hearts are turning? Are we Christians, the father, and our hearts are turning to the child, Rabbinic Judaism? Or is Judaism the father whose heart's turning? Can you get excited in this place? We sign that we want to accept the hands of Christian brothers and sisters that have been extended to us. When I read that, it was on December, I, I don't know, December, I think 19th or something. I sat down and I wrote a seven page letter to these rabbis telling them, count me in. And I quoted Jewish books and authors that are talking about things that are changing. I even quoted the liberal professor from the University of California at Berkeley, a Jewish rabbi named Daniel Boyerin. I even quoted him, who said these words in a book called The Jewish Gospel where he defends Jesus as the Messiah. Nothing in Christian theolo theology about Jesus being the Messiah conflicts with anything in Jewish theology. He examined the matter, and he found that Jesus was the Messiah, that he was the Messiah out of Isaiah 53, and furthermore, you're not going to like this. He said, we know he's the Messiah because he was kosher. <laughs> I quoted a book written by Yuval. Since the Pope went to Israel, they have been exchanging professors. They will send a Catholic professor from the number one Catholic college called the Gregorian University in Rome. They'll send a professor to the Hebrew University, and the Hebrew University will send a Jewish professor, and they're talking to the students at the Gregorian University. Yuval is the Jewish professor who wrote a book, Two Nations in One Womb. And Yuval, a Jewish scholar, tells us in his book, Two Nations in One Womb, that today's Christianity is the father of Malachi chapter 4, and today's rabbinic Judaism is the daughter. What an admission to make. I'm telling you things you will not believe even though you hear them. You can just say it if you want to. Oy vey. I wrote in my letter that Psalm 102.13 says, Now is the time to favor Mount Zion. It is now the set time. Within 12 hours of me sending a seven-page response, the rabbi responded. 
Good evening from Israel. Your letter is very touching and goes to the heart of the matter in many of the issues we face in the sacred calling of Jewish-Christian relationships. Rabbi Riskin and I both value your friendship. We look forward to seeing you in Israel. Both of our faith communities are dealing with the influence of secular culture that blots the lines of right and wrong. We Jews and Christians need to strengthen each other and have faith, with a capital F, deal with 21st century issues. We, Jew and Christians, are to be God's active agents to repair a broken world. Come stand with us. We value what you are doing. Come be shoulder to shoulder with us. I'm not the Pope. I'm not nearly as important as the Pope. But when Lori and I were the guests of the 200th anniversary of the American Bible Society a few months ago, and they had me all tied up in a tuxedo, Joe, it was terrible. You think wearing a suit's bad? Put on a tuxedo. Tuxedo pants without suspenders when you have a rotund belly fall off your body. There are little cinch belts on the side, and I had to suck it in, and they cinched as tight as they could, and they did stay up at least most of the time. If you see me in pictures, and I look like Napoleon Bonaparte, it's because I'm holding my pants inside the shirt. But we're there as guests sitting on the front row, and the day prior to the great gala ban uh, uh, banquet in the Philadelphia Art Museum, downtown Philadelphia, I was in the hallway of the American Bible Society, and up a black priest walked up to me, very nice man, and here I am hugging him and getting acquainted with him, and I didn't realize uh, at all who he was, but he found out who I was, and he said, boy, do we need your Timothy program around the world. He lives in uh, Nigeria, and uh, He's a Catholic priest and looked the part and had the cross and things hanging and so on and so forth. But here I am, and Lori is kind of embarrassed because I'm asking her to take photographs of the two of us. And I'm telling everybody how much we look like brothers. Uh, how, many can't, how many are colorblind here? I am. I'm, I'm colorblind. How many are grateful that God only made one race, the human race? And we need to stop making making distinction over a, a bit of, uh, what is it, melanin or something in your, melatonin, thank you for correcting me. Uh, who cares how, you know, here are white people, all mad at black people, and they go down to the beach in New Jersey to try to look like the black people. I mean, I don't get any of this. Anyway, this Catholic priest, the next night, unbeknownst to me, and God had already worked another miracle. I wanted to meet the head of the Bible Society of the country of Ghana, because he couldn't have been there the day prior when I was meeting other heads from Africa. And we had prayed, oh Lord, help us meet him, because there were going to be a thousand people present. So we walked into the banquet early, and we were seated at the table, and there were only two people at a table for 10 at our table. And they were dressed in African dress. I said, Lori, that's a Ghanaian couple. They're from Ghana. I recognize their dress. Guess who it was? The head of the Ghana Bible Society. And guess who I sat by the whole meeting? And guess who we got to talk about? The Lord. Uh, but anyway, as we're sitting there watching the program, which was quite lengthy. Uh, by the way, I have a photograph on this little cell phone to show you how my wife loves to have young, handsome songwriters hug her in pictures. Uh, I don't know whether she did that to get... But anyway, what's the guy's name? He's a, a songwriter. Tell me. Does anybody know the name Matt Mayer? I don't know who this is. I, I know who Frank Sinatra is, and that's about it. You know. Sorry. 
Matt Mayer, but anyway, he was the praise and worship leader for the event. And Lori said, I need a photograph of him to make my niece jealous that I was with her hero in Christian songwriting. So he hugged her a little too tight, I must tell you. I, <laughs> I'm a little nervous about that. Does anybody recognize the name Mary Ann Brown? She came down off a of platform when I had just recently married Lori, and she stopped her sermon. And she came down and stood in the audience and said, Dr. Koch's old, but he's not blind. <laughs> Mary Ann Brown, only she could get away with stuff like that. So they're having a parade of dignitaries. Mr. Green, who started the Hobby Lobby in his garage. How many know about Hobby Lobby? Mr. and Mrs. Green are very heavy donors to the American Bible Society, so they were honored. And then two black Catholic priests who are cardinals came and addressed uh, the, this thousand people to congratulate them from the Vatican for their 200 years. It was kind of funny to have a 2,000-year-old church honoring somebody that had done something for 200 years. You have to, but anyway, the second guy got up and he read a letter that was very positive simply signed Francis. Guess who that was? It's the guy I'm palling around with the day before. He is the uh, person in charge of education for the entire world to the Holy See. And he's telling me he needs the Timothy program. Now I'm there because the Bible Society wants the Timothy program in 140 nations, 147 nations. I got work that's going to keep me busy for another 147 years. <laughs> now the Catholic Pope's representative, he wants to latch on to it for the entire world. How many think these are things you couldn't have believed? That the Catholic Church is asking a Protestant for Bible college curriculum to train priests around the world. Amen. Folks, there's something happening. When I took our tour group in February to Israel, I was annoyed. Jamie will tell you. We were annoyed because we were taken off course to go see a museum that has been developed and built by Mike Evans, Friends of Zion Ministry. How many know the name Mike Evans? So we went to this museum, and I had a little sick spell, and uh, it wasn't just my temper. It was my tummy. So I stayed out, but I went into the first room, and it's a museum. You walk room by room, and it's all done electronically. So you look down at the floor, and it suddenly turns into the desert sands of the Judean wilderness. You look at the wall, and it's the wailing wall. Everything changes electronically as you walk through, and as you move, you are given a virtual tour of Israel, literally in color, and by drone, and it's a very spectacular museum. And the opening scene is the uh, previous Prime Minister, Shimon Peres, uh, authenticating and supporting and endorsing this Friends of Zion Museum. Jamie, was it worthwhile? So I'm sitting out there thinking, what in the world? This has taken us off of my tour. I'm doing my business, not the Lord's. I'm doing my business. How many have ever been in that little pity party? And so Jamie walks up and says, here's, here's uh, Mr. Stearns. Been looking to see you. Here's Robert Stearns. He's wanted to meet you all of his life. And so we're shaking hands, having never met. And here's Robert Stearns saying, thank you, Carl, for being a pioneer you and Jack Hayford have opened many doors for us here in Israel, and I just wanted to thank you. The Christian community that is solid and biblical and peaceful and not radical is being accepted by the Orthodox community in an unprecedented way. How many believe, not in chance, but how many believe God is doing something? And in the latest issue of the Fruit Friends of Zion magazine, the chief rabbi of Jerusalem came 
I believe, on Hanukkah and visited the museum. And this is the paragraph that I want to read from Michael Evans' magazine. When God is involved, and when God's people hear and obey his voice, nothing is impossible. We Jewish rabbis of account, different nations, seminaries, communities, we rabbis sign our name, we accept the hands of those Christian brothers and sisters who are offering them to us. I don't know if you've ever seen a dog when you throw fresh hamburger down on the ground, but they don't wait for you to pray. <laughs> I'm beginning to see that God's been sending me to Jerusalem to make friends of these people, and not just any rabbis, the ones that signed that declaration. And now over 150 Jews have signed on, rabbis. All over the earth. And a hundred of their inner core have seen the light. They're not changing from Judaism to Christianity, but they do understand that Yeshua, who came and died on a cross, is exactly the Messiah they anticipate very soon. They get it. That's not on the table when I talk with them. But the Lord put it on the table, and they're now accepting it. So I'm minding my own business, preparing a sermon on Shemitah, and somebody sends me the Breaking Israel News. Two rabbis that I have not met, one an Orthodox and one an Ultra-Orthodox. Those who live in New York see the Ultra-Orthodox because they are called the Hasidic Jews. They have a curl. How many have seen these people? And their tzitzit hang from their belts. And they usually wear a black fedora on top of their black cap. What they are in Christian terms, the Orthodox are Baptists and the ultra-Orthodox are Pentecostals. The ultra-Orthodox dance and they do all kinds of things that the Orthodox are a bit shy but nonetheless, they both have one conviction, that the Word of God is the Word of God and that we should obey it. So the ultra-Orthodox rabbi says to the Orthodox rabbi, we need to discuss the problems facing the Jews in this generation. So the ultra-Orthodox rabbi responds, and he said, Troubles are to be expected. It is the days before the Messiah. Things are not good in Israel. You think they're bad here? You think they're bad in Holland or Paris? Things are not good in Israel. And he says, Troubles are to be expected. Why? The Messiah is about to come. So Rabbi Sternbuch, who is the Orthodox rabbi, says, I agree. In the end days, those who fear God will despair and their hands will loosen from fighting God's war against sinners. Do you remember what they said to me? We need to stand together and let faith deal with 21st century problems. He says the things that we are seeing, the trouble in the world, is causing faithful people to let go of the Word of God. And listen to this statement. No one, no one is to be relied upon except God. All have forsaken us. Who would have thought that this nation itself would be taking its current stand and telling Iran 
we will support you should the Israelis attack you. What in this world are we thinking about? But the rabbis all get it. The only people they can count on now are what? Nations are now gone. People are giving up faith in God because the problem is so serious. But we can count on the Messiah. So he made this conclusion, and I want to explain the way Jewish people speak. Since we can't count on any nation, we must bring Messiah. They don't mean we're going to do something that the Messiah notices and then come. When they say we must bring Messiah, they are saying we must look at the Scripture and find out what the Messiah expects of us before he comes. Are you ready for the exciting thing? The ultra-Orthodox rabbi answered, and he said, the Messiah should be arriving in the very near future. So he quotes not from the scripture, but from the Talmud in a section called Megillah. And it says, the Messiah in the Megillah, in the Talmud, should appear in the year of Shemitah. That was 2014 to 2015. These Jewish rabbis were looking for Jesus to return last October. The rabbi said, I'm referring to a prediction made earlier in the year based on the Talmud because the sabbatical year of Shemitah ended this year on Rosh Hashanah in September. The year in which Rabbi predicted the Messiah would come according to the Talmud will end next year, 2016, on Rosh Hashanah. Why? This is not the seventh year. This is the year following seven sevens. We're in the year of Jubilee right now. Every 49 years, every seven sevens, according to Leviticus 25, the 50th year is a double Shemitah year. This is the year of Jubilee. We're in it. And you got two rabbis that are high profile scholars saying we were disappointed because he did not come this year. Now someone stand and read Jeremiah 8.20. Because the other rabbi said the year of the Shemitah isn't over. I don't think you're listening to me. The 49th year is over, but the 50th ain't. And I want to quote to you why it didn't happen in the 49th year of the cycle from Jeremiah 